Father, we just Father, we just worship you. We thank you for this night. We thank you for your goodness and your mercies that are new every day. Great is your faithfulness. Lord, we pray tonight that your Holy Spirit would lead, guide, and direct your people to receive that, that word that you have for them. That We ask that you speak prophetically. We ask that you speak with clarity and you restore, Lord, the joy of our salvation and renew our strength as we we seek you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We give you the glory, and we thank you for your word. We thank you, your word is life, and it's medicine. And we give you praise in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. So if you notice that tonight, um, um, I'm alone for right now. Maybe Pastor Lisa will come and join us a little later. We've got the little little one tonight. She's putting her to bed. So we're in the Torah portion by Etsy. And he went out, and that's Genesis 28, 10 through 32, 3. Hosea 12 and uh, Psalms 3 and John 1. So um, let's just look at an overview of the Torah portion tonight, and, and then we'll, we'll look at some highlights. So Jacob in his Torah portion, he leaves Beersheba, uh, the well of seven, the well of the oath. He goes to Aram, uh, his, his, his parents' family, in obedience. In obedience, Isaac and Rebekah had sent him to find a wife, and they didn't want him to have a Canaanite wife. They wanted him to go um, to their family. So on the way, he has an encounter. He has an encounter at Bethel. Bethel means house of God, where he sees a vision and he makes a conditional vow or a promise to God. So um, he, he, this is an amazing story. And we'll look at it where he, you know, he falls, falls asleep and he sees this ladder going to heaven. Um, and it's powerful. And um, after he leaves that place, he, he finds himself at Aram, um, and he's at a well, another well. And there's flocks of goats, and they're waiting to drink. There's actually three flocks there, and finally Rachel arrives, and Jacob moves this stone from the well to give the flocks water. And Pastor Lisa was talking to me about this. She goes, you know, the enemy always like doesn't want uh, the people to get the water when they need it because the people, the, the flocks were thirsty and the, they were all just laying there waiting for somebody to move the stone away. And so Jacob moves that stone away. He does the, what probably it would normally take many, many men to do that. Um, and then he goes to see Rachel. Um, he goes to see Rachel. Um, um, Uncle Laban, who is that? Who is Rebecca, his mother's brother, where Jacob agrees to work seven years for his younger daughter, and he so he sees uh, Rachel, who is the daughter of Laban and who is um, related to his mother. And so here is our little angel, Yael. Say hi. hello, Yael. Say, Say hi. hello. Say hi. Say we're learning the Torah together. Yes, I'm and sorry. I can't sleeping. be with you guys tonight. I was trying to put her to sleep, but she's not she, ready yet. She's not ready, but <laughs> I know it's going to be an awesome service. I love you guys. If, she, if I get her to sleep, I'll jump back on. All right. Have baby. a good night. All, All right. right, baby. So there's a wedding night, and at the wedding night, the older sister, Leah, she's substituted for Rachel, and uh, Jacob agrees to work yet another seven years for the woman he thought he was working for the first time, Rachel. So in a total, he's going to work 14 years um, for two wives. And when Laban does the switcheroo, he actually does a uh, kind of like does a little dig on, date on, on Jacob. And he says, we don't give the Bahor last we put the Bahor first and that's the Bahor is a firstborn um so he knew that what probably what Jacob had done stealing Esau's blessing and he was just like digging and saying no we don't do it like that um the, and the proper way is for the firstborn to to be married first and that's something that it is true it is really true so then God began supernaturally to open Leah's womb and she begins to have children. She has Reuben, she has Simeon, she has Levi, and then Judah. And Judah's the fourth son, and then she temporarily stops bearing. And Rachel is still barren, so she gives her maid to Jacob, and he has, um, or they have kids through Billa, and they have Dan, and they have Naphtali. And then Leah, seeing this 
maid thing, she sees, well, you know, let me try to give my maid. So she gives her maid to Jacob Zilpa. And then they have two kids through um, the maid, Zilpa. They have Gad and Asher. Strange thing happens. Leah hires Jacob for the night with these mandrakes in Hebrew, their dudadim um, uh, from Reuben. And uh, through this, God reopens her womb and she now has two more children. She has um, Issachar and then Dina. And now uh, she has actually seven. She'll actually have seven from her own womb. So God supernaturally opens Rachel's barren's womb after all this. And she has her first son and she calls him Joseph. Joseph means he will add again. So even when you say the no name Joseph, it kind of means God's going to add more. So she was basically prophesying through the name Joseph. Hey, if God gave me one child, he's going to give me more. Because um, Joseph literally means to add. And after Jacob has his first son from Rachel, he tells Laban, he wants to leave. This is 14 years into the, the, the agreement. He worked seven years for both each wife. That's 14 years. He tells Laban, I'm ready to go. I want to go home to my father. And Laban says, no, 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 wait, you know, um, name your price, wh whatever you want. And, and Jacob said, no, I don't want to, I'm not going to, I'm going to give you a price. And, and God had given him a strategy. Uh, and we'll look at that strategy, but he, he just worked the strategy that God gave him in a vision. Now, Laban, of course, he's going to try his best to thwart that strategy, and the Lord's going to supernaturally bless Jacob, and he's going to increase mightily in flocks and in servants, and if you look at the language of that blessing, you'll see it's, you see it's supernatural. He, he's, he's so, so blessed, and it's so supernatural because Laban the whole time is doing his best to thwart the blessing and actually to steal the blessing, to take it for himself. Um, it's not going to work, obviously. Genesis 30, 43 says, and the man grew exceedingly prosperous. That Look at this language, exceedingly prosperous. Mayod, mayod in Hebrew. And he had numerous flocks along with the female and male servants, camels and donkeys. And um, so he's very prosperous. God is blessing him in, in, in this, this new strategy that God's giving him. Um, and after Jacob sees now, that he's no longer has favor with Laban. God's not not favoring his relationship with favor with with his with Laban and, and his sons, and they they begin to act, accuse him, and he decides to secretly leave with everything he has to go back to his father's house. Now, Jacob, this is very important. Jacob did not leave until God confirmed everything with his prophetic word to him two times. So in other words, he just didn't decide to leave because he didn't have favor. He just didn't decide to leave because things weren't, um, you know, kosher. The, things weren't working out with Laban. It wasn't like that. And we've got to listen to that because you can't just leave um, if things are tough because that just, just because things are tough doesn't mean you're supposed to leave because God said, you know, he can bless you in the midst, in the midst of famine. He, he you know, um, even though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, God is with you. He didn't, you, you, as long as you just keep walking and keep moving, you're going to be okay. But there's comes a time where God will give you that word and he'll confirm that word. And, and then you know it's time to move on. Genesis 31, 3, it says, Then Adonai said to Jacob, return to the land of your fathers and to your relatives, and I will be with you. So that's verse 3. Now look at verse 13. I am the God of Bethel where you anointed a memorial stone, where you made a vow to me, get up now and leave this land, return to the land of your relatives. Can you see tonight? How many times did God tell Jacob it was time to leave? Two times. Does that not go with the scripture that says, let every matter be confirmed by at least two witnesses? So we need those witnesses. We, you know, sometimes you, you might think you know for sure, but you're not really sure until you get that second confirmation okay so genesis 35 1 god said to jacob get up get up to bethel and say there make an altar there to god who appeared to you when you fled from your brother esau now that now this last scripture genesis 35 that's not in our torah portion 
That's going to be in the next Torah portion. But so that's going to make it three times he's telling him to leave. But I want you to see something. The reason it's not in this Torah portion, because even after God told Jacob to leave two times, he decides to live somewhere else. Now, before we beat him up, let's just think about it. Has God ever told you to do something and he confirmed it to you and you still did what you wanted to do? Probably. So Jacob, he's in good company. So God will not force you to obey him. He will not force you to stay the, stay the course, but notice how the same word came back around until he obeyed it. So Genesis 31, he says, leave. He says, leave. Verse three, verse 13, leave. And then he didn't leave. He didn't, he didn't go where he's supposed to go. Genesis 35, God says the same thing again. All right. So let's move on with the story. Laban pursued Jacob and would have killed him. He wanted to kill him. But God intervened and told Laban not to do anything to Jacob. Don't even speak to him. Don't even say anything to him, good or bad. Laban then did a search for these teraphim idols that were hidden in Rachel's camel saddle. And she had taken her father's idols because she didn't want him to be a, uh, an idol worshiper. And since Laban found nothing, a parting agreement was made with Jacob where they ate bread together. And we're going to really look at that uh, in detail on, on Shabbat. So now let's go back to the beginning of this Torah portion. Um, and let's look at Jacob's encounter with God at Bethel. And keep in mind while we read the story, this New Testament um, passage that connects to this stairway to heaven, this ladder. And yes, I know the song. All right, John 1.50. Um, this is Yeshua talking to Nathaniel. Yeshua replied to him. You will see greater things than that. And he said, amen, amen, I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God going up and coming down on the Son of Man. So let's tie this scripture in with this ladder from heaven because Yeshua said, you're going to see heaven open and the angels of God are going to, angels going up, angels going down, but it's going to be on Yeshua on the son of man. So now let's look at Genesis 28, verse 10. Jacob left Beersheba. He went toward Haran. He happened on a certain place and spent the night there for the sun had set. And he took one of the stones from that place and he put it by his head and he lay down in that place. He dreamt or he dreamed. All of a sudden there was a stairway, a ladder set up on the earth and its top reached to the heavens. And behold, angels of God going up and down, just like in John. In the Hebrew, the ladder is possibly on Jacob. And that's in the Hebrew text. You can't, it, the, the ladder could be literally on him, inferring that Israel, because Jacob is Israel, that's another, he's another name for Israel. Israel is a ladder that can lead to a relationship with God. And that's really what, what Israel is supposed to do. That's their mission. They're to bring people to God. What or who is the ladder seems ambiguous. But another understanding is the ladder is the Torah itself. Wow. Isn't that amazing? That's, that's how the Hebrew understanding is. The ladder is on Jacob. The ladder could be Israel. The ladder is the Torah. The Torah is a way to connect to God. So we know that according to Yeshua, right? He's the living word. He's the living Torah. And he is the same ladder that Jacob was first made aware of at the encounter with a very special place. So Yeshua is the ladder, right? He's the way, he's the truth, he's the life. The angels are ascending and descending on the ladder as a way to connect the earth with the one who is on the top of the ladder, who is Adonai. So we're going to dig this out a little bit. So verse 13, surprisingly, Ad Adonai was standing on top of it. And he said, I'm Adonai, the God of your father. Abraham and the God of Isaac, the land which you lie, I will give it to you and to your seed. Your seed will be as the dust of the lamb. You will burst forth. I just love that word in the Hebrew. You'll burst forth to the west, to the east, to the north, to the south. And in you, all the families of the earth will be what? Blessed. And in your seed. Wow. 
That's you and I, right? Through Yeshua. Behold, I am with you and I will watch over you. I'll protect you wherever you go. I'll guard you. I'll bring you back to this land. I will not forsake you. I love this last part. I will not forsake you until I have done what I promised you. That's so good. That's so good. I, I, I spoke about this in Brazil. So God is faithful. He's faithful to confirm to Jacob the covenant of Abraham, of Isaac, and his grandfather and his father. The encounter, though, why do we need an encounter? The encounter made it personal to him. Everyone needs an encounter. The promise has to be more than what's on a page or something just passed down that was your grandfather's God or your father's God, your mother's God, your grandmother's God. You, everyone needs an encounter. Why? Because the, whatever God wants to do in our life, it has to be alive. And how is it alive? It, it's alive through an encounter. That's why it's the, the Zoe word, the living word, right? So um, how do you, and one of the ways you can have an encounter is to have a vision or a dream and, or both, right? Because it, it seems like uh, a lot, the patriarchs had a lot of visions and dreams. So Joel chapter two says in the last days, I will, you know, we're going to dream dreams and see visions. So this is time for that. And then look what, look at that last part of that promise I, in Genesis 28. I will not leave you until, look at this, I've done what I promised you. This is powerful because this is showing you that the covenant was not just Abraham's covenant. It wasn't just Isaac's covenant. Now Jacob's seeing, okay, it's my covenant to you too. So I'm God's going to do it in my life. And if you're listening tonight, you got to get a hold of that. God said, I'm not going to leave you. I'm going to do what I promised you. When you had that encounter with me, when you met me as your Lord and your Savior, or when you had that prophetic word, or when you were dreaming or had a vision, I'm not going to leave you until I do it. I do it. So prophetically, this is really interesting. Jacob is not just lying down on a small piece of land. He's lying down on what was the boundaries of the entire land of Israel. He was like he was lying on a map of the, enti the entire nation. And he said, how fearsome, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This must be the gate of heaven. This is what he said. This is the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. I want you to think about this. You can't minimize the role of the tabernacle and the temple as God's house and as a way for people to connect to the doorway and the authority of heaven. God used the tabernacle. God used the, the temple. They were a means. They were a ladder, if you will. They were a, a way for heaven and earth to connect. God's presence, his Shekinah glory would dwell in that tabernacle. And Jacob prophetically he's prophesying he's seeing a vision of the future he saw god's house and he saw god's house as a gate as a door if you will we know this 5784 it's the year of the door it's the year of the altar what's at god's house there's there's an incense altar there's a brazen altar right and, and he saw this place that all of israel they're going to ascend they're going to go they're going up because you you never go down in jerusalem you're always ascending just like that ladder they're ascending to god they're ascending to his presence and and they would go there three times a year, right? Um, and he saw his seed bringing the first fruits, bringing the tithes of everything. Jacob saw his prodigy worshiping at the place like King Solomon. His seed would do at the temple dedication almost a thousand years into the future. Jacob is seeing something. He's seeing this is the house of God. This is the gate. So early in the morning, he responds to that. He got up. He took the stone, which he had placed by his head. He set up as a memorial stone. He poured oil on the top of it. Wow, that's really interesting. And, and he called the name of that place Bethel, or God's house. Though originally the city's name was Luz. Genesis 28, 18. Jacob rose early in the morning. He took the stone that he put for pillows. He set it up for a pillar, poured oil on the top of it. And I want you to see the, the Hebrew, uh, the words for it, because it's very interesting, the word stone and the top, the word for top. Jacob took a certain, certain stone and he used it either to lay on or he put his head on a stone. Now think about this statement that Yeshua made in Matthew and in Luke. He said, the son of man 
has no place to lay his head. Jacob is laying his head on a stone. What is the meaning of Yeshua's statement? What is the meaning behind Jacob deciding to lay his head on a stone at Bethel, the house of God? Okay, so let's look at that. The word for pillows, H4763, is a place at the head, a head place, formed like 4761, only suffix, as an adverb at his head place of one lying down, a place at the head. Now look, it's interesting. The word for pillows could mean dominion or a head place. The root word means headship, dominion, or even principality. So he's laying his head on this pil pillow. The stone, I, 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 there's a takes a stone and he made the stone a, a pillow. Jacob rested where? He rested on a stone. He lay his head or he lay his authority on a stone. Your head, the word for, for head is rosh. It also means authority. Jacob rested his head on the stone of Israel. Jacob was submitting his headship and authority to one who is greater than he. So Jacob is resting his head on a stone, but he's not resting his head on a just a stone. He's resting his head on the stone of Israel. He's submitting his authority, his headship to the true authority, to the true head, to the true principality and power. Look in Genesis 49, 24. This is a prophecy over Joseph, a blessing over Joseph. But his bow remained firm and steady in the strength that does not fail, for his arms were made strong and agile. Now look what it says. By the hands of the mighty one of Jacob, by the name of the shepherd, the stone of Israel. Where does Jacob lay his head? He lays his head on the stone. He's laying his head on the stone of Israel. So Jacob in our Torah portion is trusting in the stone of Israel when he lays his head down. Yeshua, he's longing for his body to find that same rest in God's headship and authority and nothing and no one else. We have to put our head, we have to rest our head in God's headship. We got to rest our authority in his authority. No one else, nothing else takes the place of God's authority. That's the stone of Israel. Later, Jacob blesses J Joseph and he sees the same quality in his life. He lays his authority down on the pillow of God's authority. Lord, let us be like our fathers who gave such an awesome example. What's that example? We rest, we sleep, and we dream. We lay our head down, if you will, our authority on the stone, on the rock. Psalm 118, look at that same word for stone. The stone which the, the builders reject, reject, refuse is become the head stone of the corner. Wow. He puts his head. The stone is the head. Wow. You can't make that. You're going to make that up. You try it. Genesis 28, 20. Then Jacob made a vow. You can see the Hebrew words are H5087 and H5088. They're literally the same root word. Um, and, um, and Jacob made a vow or he vowed a vow saying, if God will be with me and watch over me on this way that I'm going and provide me food to eat and clothes to wear, and I return in shalom to my father's house, then Adonai will be my God. This is the this is the conditional promise. So this stone, which I set up as a memorial stone, will become God's house. That's a powerful. This stone will become God's house. And of everything you provide me, I will definitely give a tenth of it to you. And you can see the, the definitely and the tenth are the same exact word. It's, it's really two times tenth tenth to you. I'll give the tithe tithe to you. Prophetically, Jacob says that a stone will become God's house, which he anoints with oil. This is so amazing. He says this stone will become God's house. And he's going to anoint it with oil. Wow. It would be really interesting to find out, and I don't think it's possible to find out, if there was a, a, that very stone was actually used in the construction of the temple. I would not be surprised. So Genesis 28, 18, 
Jacob got up early in the morning. He took the stone he had put on his head, set up as a pillar that is a monument to the vision in his dream. And he poured oil, olive oil on the top of it. He consecrated it. Wow, this is so amazing. He, he named that place Bethel, the house of God. The previous name of that city was Luz or the almond tree. Okay, the temple, think about this. It's eventually going to be made of stone. And everything in the temple eventually is also going to be consecrated and dedicated with anointing oil. So here, Jacob is doing a prophecy of what's happening in the future. He's a, doing a prophetic act. I'm anointing this stone. Later, when the temple is going to be built, it's too going to be anointed with oil and consecrated and set apart. And then there's a seemingly irrelevant comment about the previous name of the city. Bethel was called something before. It's called Luz. But then the word Luz is another clue to the temple or the temple service. Because Luz means almond. And the menorah, what did it have on it? Almonds. Aaron's rod that budded, what did it, what it bud? Almonds. So you see that nothing's by accident. You can see the the root, the word for lose. It, it, it's believed to be almond. Jacob has another vision. Later on, in, uh, later on in the in the story, where this is the strategy God's giving him. He has a vision and he sees cattle mating. And producing while gazing at some stripped or striped pieces of wood. He's going to peel wood. So you see the white in it. Um, and one of the words is the same word for almond tree. Uh, in Genesis 30, 37. And it, 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 it will say hazel, but it literally is that same word lose. And Jacob took him rods of popular, poplar and from the hazel, which is actually that almond, lose, and chestnut tree, and, and he peeled or piled or uh, peeled white streaks in them, streaks in them, and he made the white appear, which was in the rods. And that was a strategy God gave him for the mating. He made white strips. And the word white is, is crazy. You can't make this up. It is literally the word Laban or Levon. Um, and, and it means white. And you can, you can see uh, the root word means also uh, to be or to become white. It means to make bricks, to make brick, to be made, or to make white or whiter, to make whiter, to make white. And Jacob is using this strategy. All right, peel these branches of, of these trees and, and let there be white in it. This is, this is, this is a strategy God gives him. The Laban reference is seen both in the Tower of Babel, which was earlier, and also later in the story of Egypt, as in a reference to making bricks that were baked white hot. It's, it's the same word, Levon, Laban. They said to one another, let us go and Levon, uh, make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar. Now, look at this word about white again. Isaiah 118, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they will be white as snow. They will be red like crimson. They will be as wool. Now, I want you to remember, Jacob is serving in Laban's house. His name means to make white. God is purifying him. Even though Laban's evil, God is using Laban to purify Jacob, to keep his motives pure, to, for him not to do something with his own hand, with his own power, just to follow God, obey God, and he does it. He, and, and, you, and this is amazing. We have to trust God that God can use even the bad situations to purify us and to, to, to make us white. In Daniel 12, it, it kind of shows you that in verse 10. And talking about the last days, it says, many shall be purified and made white. They're going to be Levon. They're going to be made white and they're going to be tried. Wow. But the wicked shall do wickedly and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. We got to remember that because God loves us, he chastens us. And when because he chastens us, sometimes he's going to use whatever is necessary to keep us and make us white and pure. Now, the primary way he does it is through his word, but you can't, but he wants that word to be alive in you, to work in you, to work in you. So when you're, when you're challenged and, and, and you could take matters in your own hand, 
That's not the right way to do it. The right way to do it is, okay, Lord, what do you want me to do? I'm going to trust you. And uh, you got to get a word on it now. So God is the one who purifies us. And sometimes we like bricks. We have to go through the white hot fire. Nobody likes this. I'll be the first one to tell you. Psalms 51, 7. This is David. Purge me with hyssop and I'll be clean. Wash me and I'll be Levon. I'll be whiter than snow. So remember, Jacob, he's going to make this promise. He's going to make a vow vow. This is so serious. Well, you know, on the on um, Yom Kippur Day of Atonement, we have that 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 um, that service where we we annul the vows. We we ask God to forgive us of vows that we made. The, the Kol Nidre service, which is is all about vows. Um, Nidre means Nadar. It comes from the word vow. Um, so Jacob is making a vow vow. You you have to you know Yeshua. He said don't let you know don't he said don't make a vow he said let your yay be yay and your no your no be no why because when you make a vow you've got to keep it and so jacob he makes a vow vow and he vows to give the tithe tithe literally in the hebrew it's a double of both he vows vows and he ties and he's supposed to tithe tithe of all just like abraham who tied to melchizedek we find out later though it's going to be the family of Jacob, the Israelites who come from him. They're going to be the tithers as Jacob promised they would do. So Abraham is the 10th generation of Noah's son, Shem, and he is the first person on record to give the tithe or the 10 percentage to God. Abraham is the first tither. Genesis 14, 20, and blessed be the most high God who has delivered thine enemies into our hand. And he gave him tithes of all. He gave Melchizedek, representing of God, a representative of God, you know, definitely a type of Yeshua. And every third year in the scriptures, there would be a special tithe. And this special tithe would be given to support the Levite, the stranger, the orphan, and the widow. Look in Deuteronomy 26, 12. When thou hast made an end of tithing of all the tithes, it's pretty much a double there again, of thine increase the third year, which is the year of tithing, and has given it to the Levite, the stranger, the fatherless, the widow, that they may eat within your gates and be filled. So the Amplified Notes on this scripture says, on Deuteronomy 26, 12, this is a reference, they say, to a benevolence offering given every three years called the tithe of the poor by the ancient rabbis. This was in addition to the storehouse tithe brought to the sanctuary and the pilgrimage tithe used for the expenses of going to Jerusalem three times each year. Together, the Old Testament tithe uh, amounted to a third of the total. So now let's go back to our Torah portion. So in our Torah portion, it's going to be Leah, who is the unloved or less loved wife. Sometimes the Bible will call her the hated wife. And her children, she's going to start having these children. And her children, when she names these children, the names are going to be about how she feels at the time that she gives birth. So they're going to be named for how she feels. So you got to get this. She's like, how she's feeling and what she's going through is going to be their name. So somehow she's believing that these children are going to earn her the love of Jacob. Because remember, she was switched. She was substituted for the first love, which was Rachel. And she's known as the less love. And she's trying to now, she's trying to earn Jacob's love. She's trying to get his love back. Um, and Leah feels hated because she's not the, the chosen love of Jacob's life. She, she feels less than she feels, uh, she doesn't feel good about herself. She didn't feel, how would, how would you like to be Leah and, and knowing Jacob wants to go home and be with, with Rachel? He doesn't want to be with me. And the Bible says something in Genesis 29, verse 31, it says, because of the hatred the Lord opens her womb and she's no longer barren. So because God sees her being the hated wife, he opens her womb. This is really interesting. She says, God, and then she, she starts saying things like this. She says, God, you saw my affliction. And she begins to have her, her firstborn and she has Reuben. 
in Genesis 29, 33, and she conceived again and bare a son and said, because the Lord has heard, he shamed that I was hated. He has therefore given me this son and she called his name Simeon. So let's look at these names. Let's just look at these names of her, of her sons. Really interesting. So, so this is basically what she's saying. Reuben, now my husband will see me because Reuben means see a son. Simeon, now my son will hear me. Simeon is, a, is, is now God will hear. Now God's heard me. Levi, now my husband will be attached to me. So just look at the first three. Now my husband's going to see me. Now my husband's going to hear me. Now my husband's going to be attached to me. Crazy, right? But she's naming her kids because she feels my husband doesn't see me. My husband doesn't hear me. My husband, he's not joined to me. He's not attached to me. And she names them these names. But then the fourth son comes and it looks a little different because now at the fourth son, she says, now I'm just going to praise the Lord. I'll praise the Lord because Judah means praise. And I want you to notice how her praise of, of Adonai has changed her focus, at least for right now. She's changing her focus. She has four kids, and the fourth one says, "You know, now I'm going to praise God." And she focuses her her uh, she focuses away from herself. She focuses away from her feelings and her desires, and she says, "All right, I'm going to praise." And I think this is a posture for us. We need to 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 be in that uh, that praise mode. You know, not to be thinking of, "Oh, nobody sees me, nobody hears me, no one's joined to me." Um, we need to be be like. Like Leah, when she says, oh, I'm going to praise the Lord. Now I'm going to praise the Lord. Get, get the focus off you and get the focus on God, you know? And, and you know, the Bible says, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. You know, the more we magnify him, the, the more we see how big he is in our life. You know, he's, the more you praise him, the bigger he gets. So after the fourth child, she, she ceases temporarily to bear children and she, but and, and so she gives her maid to Jacob and she has two children through Zilpah and she has Gad and Gad means now I've overcome and I will advance for good fortune has finally come to me. So now she's back. She's back thinking about herself. I mean, you can say now I've overcome. Now I'm advancing. Good things are coming to me. Hallelujah. Finally, finally, she has Asher's. This is crazy. This is crazy. Asher, Asher means blessed. She's more concerned about what the daughters will say. Think about that. The daughter's going to say, I'm happy, I'm blessed. I mean, this is, to me, she's off the rails. To, to me, she's, she's, she's lost her focus here. She's trying to earn people's a, approval by having these kids. Number five, she has Issachar, and she says, now God has rewarded me for giving my servant to Jacob. That's what she says. Zebulun, now my husband, he's going to dwell with me. Seven, Dinah, now God has judged for me and, and heard my voice. So you can, you can just see through these names how she's feeling. And, and it, you can see there's, it's not healthy. And I'm not going to blame her because I think she was put in a very precarious position um, when she was switched as, as uh, switched for Rachel. And, and from there, um, she's not feeling it. She's not feeling it. So you can see how Leah is locked in a cycle of earning love, yet she's never fulfilled in her yearning and earning love. Can love really be earned? Think about this. Can you earn love? I don't think you can earn love. I mean, you know, you, you guys can talk to us. At, you can please comment on this at the end. But I don't think you can earn love. And I don't think God wants us to earn, earn our love. These seeds in this unhealthy relationship between Lee and Jacob is going to keep going forward. And it's going to bring fruit. It's going to bring forth fruit that will not be good in the following Torah portion. So what's going to happen in the Torah portions in the future, the seeds of what's going on in her life with Jacob, um, that earning and, and yearning for love and, um, and her not being the, her being the hated wife, it's going to, it's going to really come home to roost. So 
It seems, though, that because of Leah being hated or less loved, she will pass that down to her children. So it's not just affecting her. It's going to affect those children that she even named. And Jacob, too, he's going to show favor to the children or the child, first Joseph, uh, who is the first um, born of Rachel, to the love wife. And it's going to cause problems in the family. So think about this. God does not want us to be in a cycle of yearning or earning his love, the love of God. We we should not be in that cycle. And I and I pray none of you are, and I hope I'm not preaching to anybody tonight, but you should not be thinking about earning God's love because we have it. God's love is for all of us. It's, it's, it's already been given us. And so look in Revelation 1, 4, 5, grace to you and shalom for, from him who is and who was and who is to come as well as the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Messiah Yeshua, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth to him who loved us and freed us from our sins by his love. Look, it says to him who loves us. We used to sing, so I remember singing the choruses, uh, you know, that, that famous song, he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. And he loves us. He does. He loves us. Romans 8, 37. But in all things, you are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Wow. I'm not convinced that nothing can separate us right from the that love, that height, nor depth, nor things present, things to come. You know, wow. Paul got it. I mean, unto him who loved us, nothing can separate us from that love. God does not have a hated wife. He does not hate a wife. He loves wife. He loves his wife. He loves his bride. Look in Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wives just as Messiah loved his community, loved and gave himself up for her. And I love it. It says, he make her holy, cleansed her by the immersion in the word. Messiah did that so he might present to himself a glorious community, not having stain or wrinkle or any such thing, but in order that he might be she might be holy and blameless in the same way husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Yeshua loves us. He loves himself because he, and because he loves himself, he loves us. And, you know, he died for us. You know, he, that's the proof of his love, you know, for you and I. And he, you, are a, you are beloved. You know, Revelation says, unto him who loved us. So, I mean, we, we can talk about this for on and on, but... I think most of you should never feel, don't ever feel you are less loved or you're hated. God loves you. He's, you know, he's a, he's a loving God, you know, and, you know, and the Bible talks about this over and there's so many scriptures about it. I challenge you just, just get out and just do a search on the love of God and, and uh, you know, just maybe for homework, read first John, because he loves us. He loves us so much. So Laban, going back to our Torah portion, Laban, he knows he's blessed because of Jacob. He doesn't want to lose that blessing. He doesn't want Jacob to leave. Laban does not treat Jacob right. And he changes his wages 10 times. This is what the Bible says 10 times. We know 10 is the number for, uh, could be a number for judgment. And it, it could be a favorable judgment, but after 10, a judgment is going to be rendered. Genesis 31, 11, look what it says. The angel of God said to me in the dream, Jacob, I said, here I am, Hineni. And he said, lift your eyes and see all the males going up to the flocks that are striped, are striped, they're spotted, they're speckled. I have seen this. you got to see this tonight. <laughs> That's a pun. I have seen everything Laban has done to you. I see it. I know what's going on. And we, like Jacob, we've got God looking out for us. Hallelujah. He sees what Laban does. And he's going to take care of Jacob in spite of all the attempts of the enemy to steal it, steal the blessing from him. It's not going to work. And the, and the Lord sees what's being done to you. And he's not going to let the enemy steal your blessings as well. Look in Genesis 31, 17. Now, this is the strategy. Um, I mean, this is after the strategy. This is this is now 20 years. It's going to be 20 years before Jacob ends up leaving. leaving. 
Genesis 31, 17, Jacob stood and he took action. He put his children, his wives on camels, and he drove away all his livestock and he took along his property, which he acquired. The livestock he obtained and accumulated in Padan Aram. And he went to his father Isaac in the land to go to his father Isaac in the land of Canaan. Now, when Laban had gone to share his sheep, Rachel went inside the house and she stole her father. Her father's house with gods, and Jacob deceived Laban the Aramean Syrian by not telling him that he intended to leave, and he slipped away secretly. And that's something we could definitely dig out in the future because I'm sure there's some good stuff in those that language there. Verse 21. And he fled with everything he had, and he got up and he crossed the river Euphrates, and he set his face toward the hill country of Gilead, east of the Jordan River. On the third day after his de departure, now this is interesting. On the third day after his departure, Laban was told Jacob had fled. So that's interesting. Early in the Torah portion, you're going to read, if you haven't read it, I would challenge you, make sure you read the Torah portion. You're going to see that when Jacob began to implement this strategy of the, uh, uh, that God gave him, that there was a three-day separation between Jacob's flocks and Laban's flocks. And now you have this third-day reference again. On the third day, Laban was told Jacob fled. And he took his relatives with him, and he pursued him for seven days, and they overtook him in the hill country of Gilead. So they didn't find out for three days. Laban did not find out for three days that Jacob, so Jacob has a head start, right, of three days, and then Laban pursues him for seven more days. So on the third day, Laban's told, what's three? Three could be resurrection, fruitfulness, but it also be on the wicked lamp, three could mean the hands that shed innocent blood. And that's what Laban wanted to do. And Laban wanted to kill Jacob. He intended to kill Jacob, but God wouldn't let him. So interesting, third day, three days separation. When the ark would go in front of the people, how many days would it go in front of them? Three days. Interesting. To search what? A resting place. Jacob's leaving to search a resting place for his family. Laban pursues Jacob for seven days. What's the number seven mean? It can mean completion, right? It can mean rest. So, or on the wicked lamp, the last wicked lamp, the seventh menorah, the seventh candle on the wicked lamp, it can mean one who separates brethren. Wow. Wow. That's interesting because now Jacob's going home to his brethren. So now there's this 10 day. You, if you add the three days that before he knew about it and the seven days him chasing, you put the three and the seven. Wow. What do you get? You get 10. 10 is a very significant in the number in the Bible. And, and many times 10 is a number for judgment or a number for testing. It's not the only meaning, but there's a 10-day lapse between the time of Jacob's departure from Laban, and now there's going to be a judgment because Laban's going to catch up. The ninth day, the night before, Laban's going to have an encounter with God, and God's going to put the fear of God in him and say, don't touch him. That's interesting. On the ninth day, when do we do the fast of atonement the, for the day of atonement? We started on the evening of the of the night, right? It's just interesting how that, that goes there. That's that's the same time that Laban got this word, don't touch, don't touch, um, don't touch, um, don't touch Jacob. Wow, I never saw that till I just said it to you guys. So God saw Jacob's affliction in the in the exact same language he saw Leah's affliction. Remember, Leah said, God has seen my affliction. God, and now when we read this story, at the end, when, when Laban's catching up, Jacob says, God saw my affliction. God saw my affliction. Jacob and Laban, when they come together, they build this watchtower. And, and they say, no one is able to pass over this watchtower to do evil or to harm 
the other person. They could, they could, it doesn't mean that they were never going to see each other again. They say, you can't cross this boundary, this watchtower to do each to do us to do any of us harm. I can't harm you and you can't harm me. We've got to have peace. And then Jacob is going to do at that time, he's going to call on God to be the judge between them. And it's really powerful, this, this thing. The, green, the agreement, so, so think about it. Laban is going to lose Jacob, the, the, his daughters, all this um, abundance of, of goods and servants and everything. He's going to lose it, and he's going to agree to let it go. And they're going to have this, <coughs> excuse me, they're going to have this watchtower <coughs> and God's going to judge and they, they, the, the, the agreement's going to be even further ratified because Jacob's going to make a sacrifice and an altar and they're going to have a, a bread meal together. They're going to eat bread together. Like I said, you cannot make this up because we're, we're looking at really prophecy. Genesis 31, 54, look what it says. And I, and I, and I, I, I gave you the color coding of these words because it's almost like we got like a mini chiasm here. It's like the chiasm is like you would have ABC and then you have CBA and the, the C would be the middle and it, the middle of whatever this middle is, it's going to see like, okay, that's what we really need to focus on. What's the middle? So you see that Jacob offered a sacrifice on the mount. And I put that in orange. And if you look at the end of the, of the verse, it says that he tarried all night in the mount. Wow. And then you look, so, and they called his brethren to eat bread and they did eat bread. And you Basically, you can see it's like, okay, two times mount, two, two times eat, two times bread. And the eat bread, eat bread are in the center. So that is telling us tonight that this eating of bread is got to be, and it's two times. Is it, and why would he? Why would we even get this reference? They, they, they offers Jacob offers sacrifice on the mount. All of a sudden, there's a mountain. Nowhere in the story there was no mountain mentioned. There, there never. It says they were at Galilee. They build this watchtower. There's no mention of a mountain. All of a sudden, there's a mountain. It's prophecy. It's telling us something. Because there's going to be a lot of things that happen on another mount or another mountain. And there's going to be eating right on that mountain. And uh, it's interesting. And they, so uh, and I'm talking about at the giving of the Torah. It's not going to be the only time. So they, they eat bread and they eat bread. So remember Genesis 28, 20. Remember Jacob made this statement. He vowed this vow. And he said, if God will be with me, if God will keep me. Now look what he said. And if he will give me bread to eat. And then clothes to wear, rain to put on. What is this? What is the center of this Genesis 31, 54? They ate bread. They ate bread. They ate bread in what? In peace. They ate bread in agreement. They ate bread. Jacob was blessed. He had everything God promised him, right? Jacob said, if you'll be with me, you'll keep me. You'll guard me. You'll protect me. Did God guard him? With Laban, you better believe it. Did God protect him at Laban? Did he leave Laban's with 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 um with clothing, with food, with he, he left with all that and more? And now he's eating bread. He said, God, he says, God, if you give me bread to eat and rain, I and I be believe this is not an accident. God was showing Jacob at this meal that he was being taken care of, and God was doing his part. He's he did for Jacob what Jacob had asked. He asked God, if you'll be with me, if you'll keep me, if you'll give me bread to eat. And here in that Genesis 31, they're gonna they're gonna eat together this covenant meal, if you will. They're gonna eat bread, they're gonna eat bread, they're on this mountain, right? And Jacob was eating bread with Laban, someone who hated him. Yet he could not harm him. I want you to get this in your spirit, in your in your mind tonight. Jacob's eating with someone who wanted to kill him, but the one who wanted to kill him could not harm him because Jacob was blessed and he was protected by God himself. Hallelujah. John 6, 51, I'm the living bread who came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread, he will live forever. The bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Yeshua is that bread. Look at this scripture. I love this. I love this scripture. 
you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Was not Jacob in the presence of his enemy? He ate with Laban and Laban couldn't harm him. He had to let him go and he let him go and he couldn't, he didn't get one of the blessings, none of them. Hallelujah. I, I gave you this graphic of the wicked lamp. Uh, actually, I gave you this graphic. I hope I, you might want to take a screenshot with your with your phone so you kind of can have it so you can see the seven feasts of the Lord. You can see the seven spirits of the Lord. You can see um, what each day of the Lord means, what I mean by day, the first feast, what it means, the first feast uh, Passover has to do with salvation. The feast of unleavened bread has to do with sanctification. The feast of first fruits has to do with resurrection. Shavuot has to have uh, do with authority. Trumpets has to do with covenant. Atonement has to do with judgment and Sukkot has to do with eternity. But I also gave you the seven wicked lamp. So you can see how they, how they work. And you can, you can see the Passover, the wicked lamp is a proud eye. And the, the unleavened bread, the wicked lamp is a lying tongue. The, the, the first fruits, the wicked lamp is, a, is hands that shed innocent blood. The, the Shavuot, the wicked lamp is a heart that devises wicked plans. Judgment, uh, atonement, the, the wicked lamp is false witness, breathing lies. And finally, um, uh, the, the Feast of Sukkot, the seventh uh, menorah lamp, uh, the wicked lamp is a sowing discord to separate brethren. Just so you have that as a, as a reference so you can see um, some of the things that we, we looked at tonight. So I hope you got something out of that. I'm going to go ahead and stop the, the share of the screen. And I've got everyone back tonight. And Okay, amen, amen. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.